Well, it was something of a shock last week when a major insurer said it will bow out of the California market, more or less, but it was hardly a first. And for Canadians who have experienced floods, not really a new story at all. Craig Stewart is Vice President of Climate Change and Federal Issues at the IBC. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me on, Amanda. So this notion that an insurer might choose not to insure, obviously, it's their prerogative, but what, what's the message to Canadians, some of whom have already experienced this, uh, in a flood zone where they just can't get renewed, what do people do when that happens? So Canada is becoming a riskier place uh, to insure. Obviously, we've been seeing these events year in and year out, whether it's floods or wildfires or hurricanes. Um, and, and whereas most of those risks are covered in Canada and will continue to be covered, Flooding is one that, uh, that is presently uh, not insurable in high-risk areas. And what that means is uh, take, you need to take the measures to protect yourself, identify whether you're at risk. Um, we are working with governments to try to address that problem, uh, to make sure insurance is available to all. Uh, but the reality is we just have a lot of people living in harm's way in this country. The, the fear, of course, Craig, is that extreme weather is growing. And we look at the wildfires, uh, the dry conditions and the hotter temperatures that are kind of feeding into that. And, and the real issue is if we level up, that the folks that insure the insurers, uh, which is the global reinsurance market, are also pricing this stuff more expensively and in some cases not wanting to do it. Is this just the beginning, the thin edge of a wedge, where insurance for some things will just be harder and harder to get? Yes, the answer is without some sort of partnership with governments across the country, it's going to be difficult to keep insurance available and affordable uh, given the acceleration of climate-induced events across the country. Uh, re global reinsurers just in the past year have raised prices dramatically, uh, in particular in Western Canada and in the Atlantic region. Uh, this is driven by changes in their models uh, based on uh, recent uh, events. Uh, but also in, in models for things like earthquake, where we haven't had one, uh, but uh, new science has shown that uh, Canada is actually uh, just a riskier place. Uh, reinsurers are reflecting that in their pricing, and of course, uh, insurers are absorbing some of that, but passing some of it down to their customers. So just to reflect on that for a second, to, to not be insured when a major event happens can be economically catastrophic for individuals. They can lose houses, they can lose lots of property, uh, damaged goods. If that happens at scale, if a whole neighborhood or a whole city or town actually faces that same problem, is it not de facto going to be an issue that taxpayers and governments have to step in to help with? You can't actually let a whole city get wiped out. That's absolutely true, and that is why we have uh, been discussing this with the federal government uh, since 2017. Uh, so for the past six, year, six years, we've raised the alarm, said there's certain places in this country where earthquake insurance and where flood insurance are going to be problematic, and we're going to need mm -hmm. uh, partnerships in order to address this problem. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to be able to keep insurance available. As I understand it, uh, the lower mainland of British Columbia is one place it's hard to get insurance for earthquake. So we've seen a tightening of the earthquake insurance market. Um, what happened was in 2019, Natural Resources Canada updated their seismological maps for the country and uh, realized, we all realized, that uh, earthquake risk in the more lower mainland of BC was almost double what we had previously thought. Mm. Um, and, uh, and that has led uh, insurers to, uh, you know, basically restrict their risk appetite, is what we call it, uh, they basically said, look, we've taken on enough risk in this market. We can't really afford to take on any more. Reinsurance prices have gone up dramatically. Uh, and, and that's uh, an example of a place where we need some sort of solution with governments if, if we're going to be able to keep, it, uh, keep insurance available. Craig, it's great to have you for this. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for the time. Craig Stewart is Vice President of Climate Change and Federal Issues with the Insurance Bureau of Canada. Time for the takeaway and taking a more balanced view. In a bit of theatrics, even by Ottawa's standards, the leader of Canada's opposition this week threatened to block passage of the federal budget, the one we first saw back in March. Pierre Polyev said that unless his party's demands are met, he would continue to use tactics to block the budget bill's passage through the committee process and into law. Continuing is the operative word there, because the Conservatives have already stalled this bill in a big way, including introducing 900 amendments to the budget bill and calls for witnesses at the Finance Committee reviewing the bill has forced more than 600 votes so far. 
Now there are clear demands being made. Mr. Polyev says that unless the government shows a path to a balanced budget and also kills a planned increase in the price of carbon, the Conservatives will not support the budget. Can they really do that in a parliament where they do not hold a plurality of seats? Not really. The Liberals, with the support of the NDP, were able to pass this budget into law by Thursday. But as is clear, if they want to obstruct it, they can do so. If this all sounds and feels a tiny bit like the recent debt ceiling debate in the U.S., that's because this move by the leader of the opposition is very American in nature, where opposition politicians can keep the very workings of government gummed up for political purposes. Not implementing a budget bill in a timely fashion has real-world consequences on real people. This is not a theoretical exercise. And our system of parliamentary democracy is supposed to mean that the party that forms the government can see bills through in a minority government by winning support from a big enough block of other elected members, in this case, the NDP. If the Conservatives want more influence over a budget, the time to get it is at the ballot box or by forming a better coalition with the party in power. My takeaway, using procedural gimmicks to try to intervene in the democratic process is not the Canadian way, but more important, it's not good for the Canadian economy or its citizens. That's Taking Stock for this week. I'm Amanda Lang. Thanks for being with us.